Welcome back in for our second hour in and around Bluegrass with Bill Vernon tonight. Get this hour underway, the trailblazing original sound from way back when of Don Reno on the banjo with Red Smiley and the Tennessee Cutups. And we are just tickled pink and four shades of green, too, that our live guest in the studio for this. And I guess it'll turn out to be a couple of succeeding hours, too. He is one of the great original legends of bluegrass music, Don Reno, and welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Bill. Certainly glad to be here. I'm glad we could do this. I didn't know after we had done all those things for Mule Skinner News ten years ago where I just haunted your house day and night. I didn't know what he'd ever want to say another word, uh, biographical word to me, but uh, we oh, are. Oh, yeah. You're certain. always welcome to my house or anywhere else I well, see you. I thank you, sir. I, I appreciate that. Let's start with, uh, in this first part of this hour, a lot to cover here, and uh, even three hours will just really just scratch the surface, I guess. But let's start with the sound of Don Reno and the Tennessee Cut-Ups today, and just kind of tell me where you're at, as they say, in bluegrass music in your career. After 40-some years here, you're still going strong, and how do you feel about it? I feel great, Bill. Good, good. Where have you been? Uh, you've just been to California, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. All right. How many days did you play out there? Always out there about, uh, we played about 20 days out there. Good heavens. You play every night? Just about it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to repeat any songs? <laughs> No, One or two? No, not the same night. <laughs> no, I was going to say, but maybe after two, two and a half weeks in there, you might have to sneak one in twice. They, they, they're kind of getting the hang of things for bluegrass in California. They really they? are. Also in uh, Oregon, Washington, both. Uh, oh, you went all up and down the coast yeah, out there. Right. All right. Okay. <laughs> and after all these years, every once in a while, this uh, uh, a bluegrass band, however great it is. We'll get caught in a little record company crossfire and won't have an album come out for much too long a time there. Right. And the album's still cutting up on the Windy Ridge label. That was cut a while back, wasn't it? Yeah, that was cut in April of uh, 80, 81 or 82. <laughs> <laughs> all kind of runs together, doesn't it? But uh, in it here, you had uh, your current band and they uh, redid a lot of the old, great old Reno and Smiley classics. Right. Uh, I would assume because it's side one, band one on this album, the Barefoot Nelly continues to be a request number for you through the years. It really does, Bill. And after all, how many times did you estimate you sung that? About 5,000 times? <laughs> Lord knows I yeah. don't. But And yet you still got all the old original fire and verve in it on this brand new, great old favorite Barefoot Nelly. Still sounding good as we said after all these years. And if you would like to uh, put the rave on the current band here, which is very nearly a family band in an era where that's uh, kind of gone by the boards, unfortunately, and you're keeping another great tradition alive there, having a family band. Yeah, I'm uh, very pleased with that. Uh, I've raised uh, three boys, and all of them are good musicians. And Wonder how that happened. I don't have the slightest idea, Bill. Somebody, you know, I'm always getting people to ask me, how did I get them to play? Yeah. I always uh, tell them the way to get a youngster to play is lay the instrument down close to him and dare him to touch it. <laughs> then walk off. <laughs> <laughs> what would you have done if some of the boys had decided to be IRS agents or electrical engineers or something like that? Well, I'd have, I'd have been with them all the way. Well, that's good, because not every father would. That's that's for true right there. We're speaking uh, of the three Reno boys. Of course, Ronnie is not on this particular cut, but uh, Don Wayne and also Dale Reno in there. And they've been an important part of your stage show for how many years now have the boys been in there? Uh, well, Dale's been uh, nine years, and Don Wayne is... Uh, Has it been nine years? Going on six. Uh-huh. All right. And they are here in the studio, so they may <laughs> <laughs> burst in here at any time. Right. Uh, it's a Sin is another fine song from the Still Cutting Up album, which is just, uh, it's been out, what, two, three months now, I guess. Maybe uh, four just along like there. That. All right. Uh, you had that for King back in the 60s. That's the old, what led you uh, away from bluegrass material into the old soft Eddie Arnold songs to find? Uh, well, me and Red was always looking for a good song uh, yeah. back then, and uh, it didn't really, you know... Uh, uh, it didn't matter whether it was bluegrass or who had put it out. If we if we liked a song mm -hmm. and we could adapt ourselves to most any song that come out, yeah. it was country. Yeah, and of uh, course, then back then all the country was country. Right. E even if it wasn't bluegrass, it was still just as country in its own way. <laughs> right. And uh, we liked the song, and <clears throat> we used to do it on our TV show, top uh -huh. of the morning TV show, and we decided that we'd cut it. Record it. Yeah, well, you got a good cut on it that and time it was with a Red. Great song for us back then, and uh, me and Bonnie Beverly 
put it put it on a new album. You certainly got a good cut on this one, too. Our live in-studio guest, Don Reno, the current edition of the Tennessee Cut-Ups. Don singing a duet with Bonnie Beverly there on the old Eddie Arnold song, It's a Scent. And Don Bonnie's been an important part of your scion. He hadn't gotten all the publicity that he might have got somewhere from the bluegrass industry, such as it is, but Bonnie has really been an important part of your scion, Bonnie Beverly, for, for a number of years. Yes, he has, Bill. Uh, he's been working along beside uh, me and the rest of the Tennessee Cut-Ups now since 1977. And uh, besides uh, singing, well, he plays a mighty fine fiddle since Buck Ryan passed on. Yeah. I have never really uh, sat down with Bonnie and asked him about this, but it sounded that as if he had been following your sound, no matter who you were singing with, no matter who your partner was, uh, that he seemed to be a reflection of every aspect of your sound just almost from the beginning. Yes. Uh, Bonnie's been keeping up with uh, what I've been doing mm -hmm. since back 1950. All right. When well, we first started in Roanoke. Okay. Is he from around this Roanoke area? Yes, he's from uh, up around Madison Heights in Lynchburg. Okay, Virginia. all right, that's close enough that he so would have seen. So they used the... to listen to our morning radio right. shows, and then the television advanced on into television in '55, '56. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's good because you can hear that in there. Just uh, almost. Uh, it's funny how when when you need a musician like that that can do four or five different things, uh, that there's always somebody waiting in the wings like that. <laughs> He'll be right right at the right time. That's true. One of the uh, great duets that I enjoyed the most with you and Bonnie singing is on the CMH album from 1978 there, the Magnificent Bluegrass Band, and this is another one of the old Reno and Smiley songs originally, One Teardrop and One Step Away. Don Reno and Bonnie Beverly singing One Teardrop and One Step Away song written by a gentleman that uh, I met just one time, just uh, about a year or so before he passed away, when I first got in this part of the country, and his song. I don't know anything about him very much, and maybe you'd fill me out on that, Don. I know well, he good. was uh, certainly a nice gentleman. Uh, me and Red Smiley knew him from the time we first come to Roanoke, and uh, he did quite a lot of uh, singing with us on uh, guests on our TV uh -huh. show, and uh, guests on her personal appearances and uh, this song we liked and we recorded it in 1957 for Dot right trying to push uh, give him a song, little help him up the uh -huh. ladder. Uh, was he uh, he was a singer yes he was a fine singer mm -hmm. did he have a band did he keep a band back then yes he did okay uh, yeah and we will be uh, as we what we will somewhere in this hour start back at the beginning of the Don Reno story, and it'll probably be somewhere in the second hour that we pass through 1957, and we'll uh, <laughs> we'll we'll refer back to that here. Uh, of all of the uh, distinguished honors that you've had in your career, and well-deserved honors, this uh, album with Bobby Thompson for Reader's Digest has got to be one of the high watermarks of your career. How did that come about? Well, uh, Roy Horton with Peer International right, yeah. Music, you know him. Mm -hmm. sure. Yep has been a friend of mine since I first started in yeah. the music business, and uh, he got this thing together for Reader's Digest. Yeah. And uh, uh, he suggested that uh, if they could get me and Bobby Thompson to do it. Okay, now two things come to mind. One, about 99 plus percent of what Bobby Thompson does is in a studio, probably often by himself to earphones, Right. As opposed to live music, he's recording tracks for all manner of country uh, material down there in Nashville. But bluegrass is not traditionally known as mass market music. How did Reader's Digest broaden their scope enough to get interested in uh, some real music here? <laughs> well, I don't really know, but um, they informed me that this uh, album has uh, outsold anything that they've recorded in years. Uh, well, that's, that goes to show you again, bluegrass will really grab hold whenever it has a chance, whenever it's not kind of arbitrarily being prejudiced against, I would say. Uh, I think you said to me the last time we talked, it was up over 50,000 copies then. Yeah, it's over 150,000. 150 now? Yeah. Well, that's how we talked to you last <laughs> week. No, it's been two or three months, I guess, since we <laughs> talked about that. But uh, And that's unusual in that they are the only ones marketing, am I right. marketing that right? And I but, didn't even know they was in the record business. Well, the only things they've ever done before are reissues of old big bands and jazz things. Right. And this is, uh, it's rare that they get into new music. Uh, it's going to make it a little more difficult for your fans to get that album, though, isn't it? Well, yes, I guess it is. Uh, about the only way they can get it is from Reader's Digest or 
What few copies I have left. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that's an incentive for us to play a little bit of it right here. Fine picking from two of the finest banjo pickers in the world, Don Reno and Bobby Thompson. And who played the tenor when you were, well, I'm assuming it's you. Uh, I played tenor on uh, a lot of it, and Bobby played some tenor on (laughs) some of it. I can't remember who done tenor on what now. And when you're that good at it, it all flows effortlessly. You probably could have played a baritone to it if it required. Well, of course, yes, if they wanted one. All right, okay. And, uh... Right here, another one from the Reader's Digest album entitled Banjo Bonanza. And we're going to do a little teaser on this, and we're going to play the Don Reno and Bobby Thompson cut on dueling banjos. And we won't get into the story of it this hour. And right. we'll let everybody hang by their thumbs until the third hour when we get back to the original 1955 dueling banjos. Here's, in the meantime, Don Reno and Bobby Thompson. I thought I'd heard about all the possible improvisations on the uh, theme there, or the riff, or whatever you want to call it, on dueling banjos. But uh, you and Bobby Thompson plowed some new ground there, didn't you? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, now, with all of the studios proliferating around Nashville these days, seems like about every major star has got a studio of his own. Where was this cut? Uh, this was cut in Castle Studios. Which I understand has some history behind it. It really does. Uh, uh, Castle Studio, the reason they named this, uh, there was an earlier studio named Castle Studio. Yeah, the first back, one yeah. they ever had in Nashville. Yeah. That was in the old Tulane Hotel, which right. has been torn down years. Uh, years ago. Yeah. I think it started about 1947 or 48. Mm-hmm. But uh, this is really a castle. Al Capone built it in 1926 <laughs> for a retreat. Now, and it's got the portholes for the, I mean, 22 guns up on top. Well, good Lord. Uh, black marble bathroom floors, uh, gold-plated doorknobs. <laughs> in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a castle. Yeah. Built out of rock. Well, now, there have been some bandits go through Nashville in one uh, context or another, but I've never heard the name Al Capone linked with Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> and, uh, and and it stayed uh, in pretty good shape all these years. Yes, it's in uh, excellent shape, uh, and I don't believe that any law force in 19 and 26 with the automobiles and the machinery <laughs> mm-hmm. they had to do with could have ever got to this place. Right. And with the, the road that they had to go up to to get to it. Uh-huh. Well, <laughs> the guards and everything uh-huh. that uh, Al Capone placed out, they showed us yeah. where all of his positions were at and everything out there. Yeah, gracious. Well, you have played everywhere. Very interesting, <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> when you uh, first joined Bill Monroe back in 1948, did you have any inkling of where that uh, fateful step was going to take you in this career? No, I didn't. You just you just wanted to go pick with with the man. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the story and uh, you have talked about it in in your book, your life story book. And certainly, I thank you for the copy of that. I appreciate that very much. You're welcome. And uh, you you talked about hunting Bill up and going to Nashville, and he had gone to Taylorsville, North Carolina. Right. Well, one of the legends of bluegrass music, and and I think it's going to play out true here, is that you just. Uh, uh, you found him and went backstage and got out your banjo and just wandered out on stage with him. Is that is that the way it happened? It really is, Bill. Uh, I asked, uh, I went to WSM Studios uh, early Monday morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jerry Bird was up there. And I asked him where Bill Monroe was at. Yeah. And he said, I'll tell you in a minute when I ask artist service. Yeah. So he come back in about five minutes and says he's in Taylorsville, North Carolina, Mm -hmm. playing the theater tonight. How big a jump in miles was that from Nashville? Well, that was uh, close to 400 (laughs) miles. That's a day's drive right there. I mean, a hard day's drive. Yeah, yeah. I got there about uh, 8 or 8.30 that night. And this was in the days when you'd start working the theater Maybe at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Alternating with the movie. Alternate with the movie yeah. up until 12 o'clock that night. <clears throat> Which gave you, what, about five shows in there, didn't it? Four, anyway, sounds uh, like. Three, the three, best Three, okay, I all right, okay. Uh, now, when you got there, now, the, the almost rigid legend of Bill Monroe creating the bluegrass sound is in place some uh, f- almost 40 years later. And yet, when you 
got there on stage in Taylorsville, North Carolina, Bill Monroe was using an electric instrument, wasn't he? Right. Jack Phelps was playing an electric, electric lap steel guitar. <laughs> because Bill didn't have a banjo, I'm assuming. Right. All right. And uh, that, that's just a footnote to history, but uh, it's also along the way before Bill put the original bluegrass sound together, he had accordions in the band and different things like that. So that is another another variant, if you will, off the original bluegrass sound. Right. Uh, the group that was on stage when I walked through the the front door yeah. and started down the aisle, <laughs> the bluegrass quartet was singing Wicked Path of Sin. Uh-huh. Uh, Lester Flat, yeah. uh, Benny Martin, uh, Bill Monroe, and Joel Price. Okay. What part was... Benny must have been singing baritone in there, right? And Benny Joel was Price singing was, baritone. Yeah, okay. All right, just send Joel Price on, bass in there. Uh, Bill, uh, Benny really had a better bass voice. And yeah. He had a very good baritone, but a good bass voice. But uh, Joel couldn't sing baritone, so he okay. had to sing All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, how long did you stay <coughs> with Bill? I stayed from uh, March of 48 till uh, the latter part of June of 49. And thereby missed out on recording with him because he had enough stuff in the can, I guess, that he didn't need to record. No, they had a record ban on then. Uh, nobody, okay. oh. nobody was recording. Oh, the, another of the Petrillo bands. Uh, right. Okay, I'd, I'd forgotten about that one. I remember the one in, <laughs> during the war. Okay. Uh, now, this was not the first time that you had touched bass with Bill Monroe. No. You'd, uh, you you went back into the early 40s with Bill, didn't you? Yeah, 1943. Mm-hmm. Isn't that when Bill offered you a job? Right. Well, now, that needs to be underscored here because uh, from everything I've gathered, uh, this kind of music is woefully weak in home recordings or air shots or anything that would have preserved a lot of the music that was not on uh, commercial phonograph records, but you were playing in the Snuffy Jenkins-derived three-finger banjo style. Right. Am I right? Okay. Right. And uh, you must have had it going pretty good, or Bill wouldn't have offered you a job. Well, I was uh, I was hanging in there. Uh, <laughs> okay. And so all right. And why didn't you take the job? Well, uh, my brother. I had only one brother, and he yeah. had to go to the army. Mm -hmm. I knew that he was going to have to go to the army. He was the oldest, and I was the youngest. Yeah. He was 16 years older than I was. There are sisters in between, I gather? Right. Yeah, okay. So I knew if uh, he went and I didn't, I'd never hear the end of that. All right, okay. So I volunteered when I was 17. I told Bill, I said, I'm going to, I'll be 17 years old in a short while, mm -hmm. and I'm going to volunteer, and if I don't uh, pass my physical, I'll go to work with you. Uh-huh. But I did pass my physical because in... That era in World War II, if you could walk in and walk out, they passed you. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, and so you went off to the Asian Theater. Right. If I remember correctly, you got wounded a time or two, too, didn't you? Well, slightly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing serious, but uh, I did come out with a couple of battle scars uh -huh. on. Well, uh, how did you feel when uh, you got back and all of a sudden... There is a banjo picker with Bill Monroe, and it is not you, and it is Earl Scruggs, whom I gather you had known before either of you had known Bill Monroe. Am I correct on that? Well, I had known uh, Bill since I was uh, probably six or seven years oh, old. Oh, okay. And, uh, All right. I'd known Earl since I was uh, about 12. Okay, okay. And uh, here's Earl on stage with Bill at the Opry, and uh, from the surviving Grand Ole Opry dubs, he was really tearing it up, and the crowd was really eating it up. And uh, did you feel any pangs of regret, thinking no, that that uh, might have been you? No, I was uh, really proud of Earl, good. you know, uh, yeah. because uh, he'd always been a good friend of mine, and yeah. I, I liked Earl, and uh, I always thought he was a fine banjo player, and I still think he's one of the greatest. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I thought Bill's band sounded... Uh, terrific. Yeah. That's that's I one of the great did. bands of all time. I think so. And uh, I just, uh, I wish uh, <coughs> that there were some surviving... A friend of mine in Indiana has one scratchy old dub of <laughs> you with Bill in 1948, and I haven't even had the pleasure of earning that. Before we uh, update to your first recordings, let's, uh, there is a story floating around 
uh, again, this is a legend, and let's see if it's true here, that at some point in your joint careers, you and Earl Scruggs just traded banjos. Yes, the swap banjos. We did. What brought that about? Well, that stemmed uh, from uh, 1940 uh, till 1948. Earl wanted my banjo mm -hmm. that I had got from Snuffy Jenkins. All right. And uh, I caught him in Bristol with a banjo that I thought was uh, <laughs> a good banjo. And uh, finally I said, I asked him if he still wanted to trade banjos. And he said, yes. And you gave what model banjo, and you got what model banjo here? Well, I give him a Granada, uh -huh. and I got a, a RB3 uh, Master Tone. Do you still have that Master Tone today? I, I do. I, I took it out this morning and looked at it because <laughs> somebody stole my other banjo last night. <laughs> Aren't you serious? No. <laughs> you better not. Be. Now, look, the only place that happens is in New York. It's not supposed to happen down here. But, uh, all right, let's, um, let's update here to 1951. And by this time, if I'm not mistaken, you are already here in Roanoke with Tommy Magnus. Right. 1950, to be exact. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, now, how did had you known Tommy before that? Oh, sure. I'd known Tommy since I was... Uh, small boy okay he stayed with my brother uh two years oh he was 16 and i uh -huh. was probably about seven or eight so that's almost like an uncle right yeah okay and this must have been where you met red smiley it was okay i'd heard of red all my life mm -hmm. and he'd heard of me yeah. but we had never uh, met until? Until we did a radio show together December 27, 1949. Now, you mentioned in your book that you did an unrehearsed radio show. We did. We didn't have time to rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> just tuned up and had at it. Just, that's right. That's incredible. Uh, in this, I just read, uh, by contrast here, I just read something in the trade papers the other day that one of the Nashville superstars is proud of a new album he's done, and he put in more than a thousand hours of studio time making about 40 minutes of music. Nah. And, <laughs> yeah, and I think times have changed here. We have uh, one of the original of the four cuts that Don Reno and Red Smiley, still side men then, but not to be side men for long, did with Tommy Magnus. The Wings of Faith the Tommy Magnus band that uh, I gather Don was working here on the radio. Was it was the band right. on WDBJ here in Roanoke at the time that these records were made? Right. We was, we was working uh, out of Roanoke, and uh, uh, Remus Bell was uh, singing bass on this. Jack Phipps was singing baritone. Red was singing lead, and I was singing tenor. And Jack was playing the lap. Yeah, Steve we heard in there. Of course, we always put the footnote in that back then the uh, lines between country country was not the opposite of bluegrass as it no. is liable to be now. So a, a lap steel in there. Uh, you did occasionally have electric instruments wandering through otherwise acoustic music, and so the band leader does not sing at all on that. No, he just doesn't sing at all. Playing bass fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> and all right, and and getting his name on the record. Where were these four sides for King's Federal Subsidiary cut? Uh, Cincinnati, okay, King's you went, Studios. Went Cincinnati, okay. Uh, you had, uh, is it not true that you wrote all four songs? Almost? Right. Yeah. Have you kept, uh, I think the last time that you gave me a figure was in the 400s. I suspect that you've written at least 500 songs by now. Mm, 497, I'm 497, yeah. all right. And check back with you next week to go over <laughs> 500, probably. All right. Uh, so where, um, how do we get from... Tommy Magnus with Reno and Smiley as sidemen to Don Reno and Red Smiley in the Tennessee cut-ups, at least on record. Well, uh, Sid Nathan wanted to put uh, Don Reno and Red Smiley on Federal. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we went up to record as Tommy Magnus and the Tennessee Buddies, and I said, no, yeah. that's uh, not the way I play ball. Uh, we'll uh, put Tommy Magnus and the Tennessee Buddies on these records here yeah if we ever record again we'll put don reno and red smiley on right so he just signed a four four song contract with tommy yeah and uh, why were those uh, records on the federal subsidiary rather than king itself because they're certainly a quality music 
And Tommy was well known then. Well, he was, uh, he wasn't taking any chances. Okay. Uh, he didn't know this, see. He, uh, Sid wasn't as well versed on, uh, Tommy Magnus's fiddle playing as he should have been. If he had been, he would have put it on King. Right. Okay, I was going to say. And would have had a fiddle number out of Tommy Magnus on on something. That's right, because there are none. There were none recorded for King, were they? No. Not by him. Okay. No. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so uh, it is, it's January of 52 that you debut the Tennessee Cut-Ups, is it not? Right. And had you, you and Red must have already left Tommy by then. We did. We left uh, Tommy in 1951. Okay. And Went to Wheeling, West Virginia, and uh, worked with Toby Stroud for a few months, and then I went back to South Carolina to look after my father, and Red went with me, and then's when we yeah. reorganized Don Reno, Red Smile, into Tennessee Cut-Ups. I guess uh, for most people that have a nine-to-five job where longevity is to be desired, uh, your, your salary and your benefits and everything increase the longer you stay with the same company, I guess it's a little hard for them to realize that in the music business, uh, when you go to work for a band leader or you go to work at a radio station, you might last uh, three months or ten years, and you never know. That's true. Uh, has it ever, this is just, I guess, a parenthesis, but does it uh, kind of bend your head a little to be working for a different person every time you hit the stage after all these years? Um, no, I'm used to that now. Okay. Uh, you know, but isn't it a built-in, a little bit of a built-in insecurity, wondering whether you're going to get paid unless you know the man real well? Well, I have worked dates and wondered, you know. <laughs> All right. Because I would think in case, uh, that's always one extra little built-in pressure and tension thing, then I guess that somebody uh, with a strong union and all that goes with it might not realize that, uh, especially, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have to be uh, just uh, an after-supper band at a festival, but some of the biggest stars. Right. We'll, we'll uh, go over the cliff even harder for being bigger stars, and uh, when they run on to certain promoters, I guess. I just wondered about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, I, too, every once in a while have gone to the empty trough, but not nearly uh, on such a large scale, maybe as often as you had to. Uh, how long had, uh, had you been writing songs on something that seems like a regular basis to me uh, when you did your first session for King with Red? Well, I started writing songs... Uh Actually, in 1939, hmm. uh, the first song I ever wrote was uh, Jesus Will Save Your Soul, and uh, we recorded it on uh, the first recording session with Tommy. Uh huh. And uh, later on, me and Red recorded it uh, yeah. on King. Right. We have. I think I have that album with me tonight. Not the original cut, because some of my originals got uh, scratched up a little through the years here. And scratches play on 100,000 watt FM, sometimes <laughs> even louder than the music does. Uh, you had a, uh, if not an immediate hit, certainly a great standard through the years with the first release, I'm Using My Bible for a Roadmap. Yes. How long uh, before you recorded that had you written it? I see another composer name on there, too. It's going to be a double question. Who is the Schroeder that well, is listed that's, on that? Uh, Nelson King. Uh, the DJ? In Cincinnati. Was that his real name? Schroeder was his real name, but his radio name was Nelson, Nelson King. King. Right. <laughs> uh, Nelson didn't write any of the song. Okay. I give him half writers on it because Sid Nathan suggested. Yeah. Because he was on a powerful 50,000 watt radio station and. Might therefore be more inclined to play your record. He says uh, if you give him half writers on this, well, I know that he will. Lay it on the turntable. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, remarkably um, opportunistic, shall we say, for a gospel song. I'm using my Bible for a road map, and that, I would say, not only has been a great song for you through the years, but also has been recorded by any number of other bluegrass pickers and singers, too. Yes, it has, Bill. And so that's, that's been one of your best songs. Had you had that written a while, but uh, when you recorded it, when, when did you write that song? Well, uh... As we was coming back from recording with Tommy Magnus, we had a car wreck up above East Raynell, West Virginia. Uh-huh. And uh, we got uh, banged up pretty bad, and I told Red Smiley, I said, I think I better start using my Bible for a road map. <laughs> he said, that's a good song title. I said, well, uh -huh. I'll, write one. I'll write a song. That's always been an important part of bluegrass songwriting is when the musicians themselves 
write true life songs. Bill Monroe has the biggest reputation, I guess, for that. But most of the other uh, great bluegrass songwriters, yourself included, I, I assume, have written a lot of songs that come out of your own true life experiences. They have, yes. I suppose the, the saddest true life experience that you ever have written about has been the song A Rose on God's Shore. Yes, uh, that and uh, Pretty Wreath for Mother's Grave, I think, was two of the uh, saddest songs I ever wrote. And it hurt me worse to write. And they are both from True Life Experiences, aren't right. they? Right. In uh, June uh, 18th, 1950, Verlin Reno, my nephew, was working with us in Roanoke mm -hmm. as part of the Tennessee Buddies. And uh, before that, he was one of the original members of the Tennessee Cut-Ups. And uh, we went fishing in Calpasta River, and he got drowned. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, uh, May the 7th, I lost my mother. In the same year? In the same year. So and these two songs, let's, uh, let's hear them back to back here, because this... And now that you explain this, I can see why uh, all over again. But this is some of the most emotional, tender, beautiful singing, I think, that you and Red ever did in your entire career. I notice in listening along to those two beautiful songs, among the other things that you do so very well, it doesn't seem to perturb you at all to be able to sing and pick at the same time. Mm -hmm. you're, you're putting in the not just rhythm, but you're putting in all the pretty fills there on the banjo while you're singing. Yeah, uh, that was always uh, come easy to me, Bill. <laughs> And uh, I still do it. There are some people in this world who can string anything and be picking it in 30 <laughs> seconds, I believe. And you are certainly one of them. Uh, for our whole first hour gets away here, let us mention a big personal appearance by Don Reno and the Tennessee Cut-Ups right here in Roanoke, Saturday night, December 17th. Right. At the Iroquois restaurant that the chief has got. Uh, he's got some bluegrass coming in there, down there. And you and the Cut-Ups and Jim Eans. Right. We'll be there from nine to one. I remember the time you played in Rocky Mount. Uh, Jim had uh, had about nine more verses to one song. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. everybody, <laughs> everybody kept putting a little shave and a haircut. I think on budded roses. And Jim had I'd, I'd never heard so many verses to that song in my life. I didn't know there's that many too. No. Uh, he I don't did too many for him to have made up backstage. So they must all be a uh, hundred years old well, with the song. There. Jim's a good singer, a good Great friend of singer. mine, and yeah. me and him worked together a while with Bill Monroe and uh, right. That's we'll be singing some together down there. And night. I expect you'll be singing I Wouldn't Change You If I Could. Probably. Because you both had records on it and Jim wrote it and all of that. Now, uh, just we'll, we'll underscore that again here. Don Reno and the Tennessee Cut-Ups and Jim Eanes, a great night of bluegrass entertainment. Saturday night, December 17th at the Iroquois Restaurant, downtown Roanoke. Formerly the King's Inn and easy to get to. And you were mentioning here while we were setting up the tape that uh, one of the records that you had come out 30 years ago this month. Is that what you... December? December. Th yeah. Right. How do you stay so young after 30 years here? I'm staring across the room at you, and you don't look too much older <laughs> than those pictures from Bill Monroe in 1948. I can't Well, I've got a little years. girl, four years old, Mitzi. <laughs> she keeps me young. Is that a cause or an effect of staying young? I'm not quite sure which. Uh, <laughs> One of the way you want to put it, Bill. <laughs> Welcome back in. The name of the program, In and Around Bluegrass with Bill Vernon. And once again, for this hour, our live in-studio guest here on the program, one of the great all-time living legends of bluegrass music, Don Reno. And Don, welcome back for another hour of music and conversation here on the program. Thank you, Bill. Glad to be back. And tonight, kind of a uh, two-fold purpose here. First of all, we're going to be exploring some of the, uh, the glory years on King of Don Reno and Red Smiley but also on the sad occasion of the 12th anniversary of the passing of Red Smiley. We'll be talking some about Red and the great contributions that Red Smiley made to bluegrass music. I remember you said that you had uh, first gotten together with Red in 1950 here in Roanoke with Tommy Magnus, right. and that, um, that partnership continued, or at least that association continued, for all but just a few years there in the latter half of the 1960s. I, myself, is one of the people that I never had a chance to really get to know. One time in New York, I think, Don, you stayed and played fiddle in a jam session up there at that church on East 68th Street, and Red and I went out and had supper, and that's the only time that I didn't had a chance to really get to know him, and he seemed to be uh, just a square shooter and all around, not yeah. only a great performer, but a great gentleman, too. He really was. He's one of the finest uh, musicians and gentlemen that... Uh 
Never walked on two feet. Seemed to be stable and level-headed and uh, seemed to be a grown-up at a business where there's a lot of children walking around in grown-ups' clothing. <laughs> That's true. And I had looked forward to that just about the time there that I had uh, moved down around the D.C. area, and I'd been looking forward to getting to know him because he had just purchased some uh, property. Did he? Uh, was he not intending to live on a small island off uh, the east coast of Virginia? Well, he had purchased some property down there back in... Uh, uh, late 50s, I believe, Bill. and He just getting around to moving. Built a house down there, uh -huh. and he was just getting around to moving down uh -huh. there. Yeah, well, it, of course, a shame and a tragedy, and I know uh, special memories that people have for Red here in the Roanoke area from all the years that they saw Don Reno and Red Smiley on television and heard him on radio and personal appearances. And what Don has done for this hour is go through a lot of the records and pick out some of the songs that Red Smiley liked best, and here's one of them. One of the great classic original Reno and Smiley recordings, another song written by our live in-studio guest this hour, Don Reno, and featuring the singing of Don Reno and Red Smiley, Your Tears Are Just Interest on the Loan. One of the songs that Don mentioned was uh, one of Red's favorites through the years. Right. Uh, did your favorites and Red favorites um, always correspond with what uh, was most popular, or were there just some things that you liked through the years that... Uh, whether well, or not they had a special appeal. Our minds kind of run on the same uh, course all yeah, the time. Uh, yeah, you seem to be the... Uh, I remember seeing you one time in New Jersey back when you had the... We, we need to talk about that, too, I think. Uh, the the great comedy that, <laughs> yeah. that you all did. Because now that has... Uh, the, I hadn't really intended to talk about it right here, which just crossed my mind. And that was one of the all-time great stage shows <laughs> in bluegrass music. And... You all, the four of you, with, with when I saw you with Mike McGahey and John Palmer, that all just seemed to fit together. Uh, you you must have put a little forethought into that, a little planning and forethought. That could not possibly have been that good and still be spontaneous and unrehearsed. No, we, we did a lot of uh, planning yeah. for our comedy shows, and uh, then we fell into them with the gusto of a hound dog when we got into <laughs> yeah. them and had as much yeah. fun doing them as the people yeah. did watching them. Right. Yeah, that's, it's a sad thing that a lot of that has gone from country and bluegrass music. It is. And where, I mean, you can see it on television on Hee Haw, but oftentimes they're, they're making fun of it as much as making fun with it, I think. Right. And uh, it always disturbs me just a little bit. For people who may or may not have heard the sound of Reno and Smiley on, on records, on various DJ shows, I suppose a lot of people in the Roanoke area first came to know the sound of Reno and Smiley with your radio and your, then your, later on your television work. Right. When did, uh, I know you were here with Tommy Magnus, but when did you and Red as the Tennessee Cut-Ups first hit the radio here in Roanoke? Well, we hit television. First. Okay. First. Oh, all yeah. right, yeah. Uh, that would be. Would that you? was also December the twenty seventh, uh, nineteen and fifty six, when television was still in its infancy. That's where right. I went astray here. Okay, because I I didn't realize that uh, television had enough sense to put a great bluegrass band on that early in the game. There, you have well, an amazing memory for dates, incidentally. Well, things <laughs> like that, you know, kind of stick to me because I, I didn't think anybody watched television that early in the morning myself back then. You found out different, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I really did. I got the shock of my life. I yeah. remember John Harkrader. I asked him, I said, what kind of a rating are you expecting us to come up with <laughs> mm -hmm. on this show? Yeah. And I was used to 37 to 40 rating on a night show. Yeah. And he said, if you can get me a four rating, I'll be tickled <laughs> to death. And I said, if I don't get over a four, I'll be gone, son. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd never heard tell of a four rating before, you know. Right, But yeah. uh, then I said, nobody watches television that hour of the yeah. morning. He said, oh, yes, they do. Yeah. So uh, our first rating, we had three months for a rating and come up with a, almost a 12 rating. We beat the Today Show. <laughs> they were right. turning cartwheels, and I was very unhappy about it. I thought that was a very poor rating. <laughs> But now the show stayed on. You you and, and Red had the top of the morning show on when Red retired. Did you? Yeah. Know? You, and, uh, right. Okay. And, or at least, uh, now l let me get this straight. Did he semi-retire? Did he stay here and keep the show even though he did not travel on the road? Or how did that come Yeah, out? he, uh, I left him here with the show and uh, to keep him off the road. Yeah. Because okay. I knew his health was bad. And uh, he stayed on with the show till. 1968, I believe. Right. Then somebody else bought the 
mistaken. Okay. The station out and decided to delete the show. Okay, and that, uh, as I know from radio work, any time uh, a format changes, well, everybody tends to go out the door with the broom there, no matter how great they've been. Right. And one other parenthesis here, that for anybody that thinks it's easy for a musician to show up and play a couple of 40-minute sets for a four-figure sum, a high percentage of these great musicians have just gone through medical hell. There's no other way to put it. <laughs> right. And it always, or at least in a lot of cases, seemed to be the people who uh, would deserve all manner of happiness. Now, Red just had um, uh, multifaceted medical problems through the years, did he not? Just one on top of another. Yes, he did. But in uh, this uh, is, now he, as we said, he, Red Smiley passed away on January 2nd, 1972. And since this is the program that will air closest to that date, this is not only an uh, interview with Don Reno, we certainly appreciate being here in our studios, but also a tribute to the memory of Red Smiley. Song entitled Forgotten Man, another of the great Reno and Smiley originals. And for this session, Don, you had Benny Williams in. The, the bluegrass chameleon is what I think of him. He plays all the instruments, sings all the parts, has worked with just about everybody from time to time. Uh, what was Benny doing? Well, he was not a regular member of the band, was he? Or was yeah. He, he uh, was. Yes, he was a regular member of the band for, oh, I don't know, from... Probably eight months, something oh, like that. Oh, okay. All right. Cause he he'd come to town to go to work with Mac Wiseman, and Mac had already left. <laughs> and, uh, Benny didn't know when he came to town? No. No, oh, okay. So uh -huh. I took him in, <clears throat> yeah. fed him, uh -huh. cut his hair, <laughs> yeah. gave him some shirts, and took care of him for three or four weeks, and yeah. found out how good he was, and me and Red decided to hire him. Yeah. <laughs> And he was with the band long enough to make uh, at least a footnote to Bluegrass History because he's in playing mandolin and twin fiddle on I Know You're Married, but right. I love you still. Uh, now, the song credits on that. Now, a lot of times they say Don Reno alone, and, of course, we cleared up the Schroeder situation last time, and sometimes I see the Reno and Smiley song credit. On this one, I see Don Reno and Mac McGahey. Who wrote how much of the song here? Well, I wrote the song. Uh, okay. Mac come up with the title. Oh, all right. Due to uh, uh, a dear John letter he got while he was in Korea. Oh, okay. And he uh, blushingly told me one morning, riding on Highway Number One between Washington and Richmond, he said, "I'd tell you the title of a good song, but you'd <laughs> laugh yourself to death at me." And I said, "What is it?" Uh -huh. He said, "I know you're married, but I love you still." I said, "That's a blame good title." I rode it in the car in about 15 minutes riding down the road. <laughs> now, the only other bluegrass songwriter that I've ever heard of that could write a song that great that fast was Hank Williams. <laughs> so you're in good company there. Now, uh, looking down the, the list of uh, when things were recorded and when they were released, there the King label that you were recording for had some other material that I'm assuming they thought was stronger because they put it out ahead of this song. They did. They, they thought this was the sorriest song on the... <laughs> album we we cut yeah and uh me and mac and red kept telling them you know that this is one of the best songs we'd cut were you singing it on stage before it came out uh, on record yes and you were getting good response good on it. response uh -huh. yeah. was it an immediate in-person hit it really was okay. uh sweethearts in heaven we did on dot come out and right. was a uh, was a hit, and Sid, this was the last song that they had in the can, so Sid turned yeah. this out loose, yeah. and it passed Sweethearts in Heaven in about <laughs> two weeks. And this has become uh, not, not only a bluegrass standard, but lots of the country artists have, have recorded it too, right? Right. And even some bluegrass, uh, some country singers who've had nothing to do with Didn't Bill Anderson record it? Bill Anderson recorded it. Buck Horns recorded it. Uh, Tom T. Hall recorded it. Red Savine recorded it. Uh-huh. Porter Wagner and Dolly Parton recorded it. And it has thereby become uh, not only a great bluegrass standard, but a great country standard, too. I know you're married, but I love you still. The famous, I know you're married, but I love you still. And I suspect that you are married to that song to the point where you got to sing it about every night of your professional life. I sure do, Bill. <laughs> yeah, uh, we could probably take two or three hours if you had to think back to the last day that you <laughs> had not sung it on a personal appearance. Uh, it's a, that is a great song. And... Uh, I think I can probably go down through the list with not only your material, but a lot of the other bluegrass material that's been done for major labels where the label owner or the producer or whatever was not primarily concerned with bluegrass, where they didn't know what the good stuff was. 
No, they really didn't. Because a lot of stuff from Bill Monroe's, a lot of stuff from Flatt and Scruggs is that was uh, even better than what came out got held back. Right. And some of the things that you later did, uh, uh, just a used to be to you, is the one we were talking about while the record was playing. There were that, uh, that took a long time to come out, just barely did come out. Yeah. The album that you did, the Wanted album, I always thought was one of the best albums that you ever did, not only for the music, but because whoever engineered it seemed to have his ducks in a row that day. Yes, he did. Uh, Chuck, uh, I never can remember his latest name. He later on uh, went to RCA Victor and was an engineer with them. Uh, Seats? Sites? Sites, yeah. Yeah, S-E-I-T-Z, okay. Right. All and, right. Uh, he was a, a bluegrass picker himself. And isn't he one of the writers of Before I Met You? I that think same maybe boy. so. All right, okay. That's another little footnote. Let's not get too far off into the footnotes here. No, that, that album... Uh, Actually, uh, Sid Nathan of the King Records made me mad uh, the night before that album was cut. Uh -huh. uh, he wanted me and Red to cut some rock and roll. Mm. I said, Sid, you've got uh, every rock and roll star in the country recording. For That's right, he did. He was riding the crest James there. James Brown, Hank Ballard, yep. uh, Little Richard. Yeah. And I said, uh, the closest thing I'll ever get to you as country boy rock and roll. Right, which you had done. Now, that was from the same session as I Know You Married, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So the next morning, I went in, and uh, I had picked the songs out mm -hmm. that I was going to do yeah. and told him, I said, I'll either do them here or I'll go on down the road somewhere else and do them. And he said, well, if your mind's made up going in the studio <laughs> and cut what you want uh -huh. to. Well, I was about half mad when yeah, I cut that yeah. album, but... Uh, I wanted to really throw it, you know, is well, all of us were. Yeah, right. Well, now, that's uh, what I was going to say. Of course, it sounds like I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here, but I have noticed in that album that your your duet style and the whole approach was <laughs> closer to a tougher Monroe sound yeah. than the customary Reno and Smiley sound. It was. And I know from having been around Bill Monroe that being angry will fire his adrenaline. <laughs> So I think we're going to hear the same thing here on a song called Love, Please Come Home, which in its own way has also become a bluegrass standard. Now, to me, that's one of the all-time great classic cuts in bluegrass, and it does tickle me that uh, you were fired up in the adrenaline department to do that because there's always been that, that pert quality in good bluegrass music that may be getting lost a little through the years with a lot of the modern bands, but uh, it, it's, it certainly is there in abundance. Uh, an obscure group for King, Leon Jackson and Johnny Bryant had cut that song. Is that where you heard it, or did Sid yeah. bring it to you? Okay. Uh, no, really, I heard it from uh, Melvin Goins and uh, uh, Ray. They come down to be a guest on our show, uh -huh. TV show one morning. <laughs> and and they were singing the song. And they did the song. They'd heard Leon's version. Right, yeah. Uh -huh. I don't, uh, just very quickly, I don't know anything about Leon Jackson and Johnny Bryant. Do you, well, I don't do you, either. Yeah, just, just two names on a record. That's right. Yeah, I did Four Sides and Disappeared, I guess. Right. Uh, the song we just heard there was cut after you returned to King. Uh, is it some of this adrenaline here that caused you to, uh, to leave King and move to Dot Records long enough to record 12 Sides, or were yeah. there other reasons to that? Yeah. You just weren't seeing eye to eye with Sid. No, uh, Mac Wiseman was a and R man with Dot. Yeah. At the time we went to Dot, and uh, of course we thought maybe, you know, uh, the pasture was greener over yonder. But now, we found out uh, really, yeah, the pasture wasn't greener over yonder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, this would be 1957, right? Right. Where things were really kind of grim for any kind of country music in Nashville. I think that's where Nashville about swallowed up and just withered away down there. Yeah. And so I think, uh, as I remember this, uh, lots of people were running scared. It, was kind of, it must have been difficult for you to keep an acoustic music, country music band going in the face of all of the things that Elvis Presley, all of the convulsions that he was causing in, in all kinds of music. Well, uh, our early morning television show in Roanoke and the one we had in Harrisonburg, Virginia on Wednesday and Saturday night, uh, we were self-contained, really. We yeah. We could play most anything we wanted uh -huh. to. Were these shows all done live? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, now, if you did a television show Saturday night, that kind of cut into going out and doing a personal appearance for well, somebody. Well, we did uh, from uh, 
6 to 7.30 oh, uh, okay. in Harrisonburg and come down to Verona, Virginia and did a dance every ah, Saturday gotcha. night. All right, okay. That's another great tradition, playing for dances. <laughs> Back then, that's, that's kind of gone astray, too. A couple of the songs that you picked out here from the Dot album that uh, you mentioned were the late Red Smiley's favorites are a couple of songs that also, I believe they both feature Mike Wiseman singing the high part there. Right. All right, he is, in this case, you're singing the tenor and he's singing the high baritone, right? Right, though. Okay. That's one of those things where I heard it and I knew the voice, but it took somebody to tell me before <laughs> I got one of this because I just wasn't, wasn't quite making the connection. Here's a pair of songs from the brief period that Don Reno and Red Smiley were with the Don label. Won't You Kiss Me One More Time? And Where Did Our Young Years Go? I hear twin fiddles on there, and if my memory serves, the other one is Benny Martin. Benny Martin, Mike McGay. All right. Who did which parts in there? I would think Benny, being the swapper of the two fiddlers, might be the tenor on that, if I just I want to so. hazard a guess. I think All so. All right. Uh, Mike, more of a straight-ahead, kind of hard-charging fiddler, right. basing how well they blended. Although Benny had spent several years with Flight and Scruggs, was he just in Nashville hanging around at the time, or who was he working with? Uh, Johnny and Jack, maybe? No, I think Benny was more or less doing studio work mm -hmm. at that time. Okay. Probably working the Grand Ole Opry on right. Saturday night. Okay. All right. And that uh, that was a fine sound in there. And I think also the, the pacing of those songs there. Uh, and I note that they could, uh, if you took those songs and did them with the electrical Nashville studio rig of the day, that they would have been regular old country jukebox songs. Right. Uh, this was something I gather that uh, bluegrass had to do to survive. The guy, just about everybody but Bill Monroe and the Stanleys did that kind of thing, didn't they? Kind of make a, a broader based right. song in there. Right. And uh, was a, of course, I'm assuming also that would fit in with the fact that you were playing a lot of dances. Yes. Yes. Because uh, that's good slow dancing music right there for late at night. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably observed it a thousand and a half times. And so uh, you just uh, you decided to beat a path back to King. Right. Okay. Uh, all of the, th w uh, were these records made in Nashville? Mm-hmm. Because Mike yes. was headquartered in Hollywood, wasn't he at the time? Uh, or I was, believe so. And yeah. he would fly in. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Flew in for the. All right. Uh, we are going to jump ahead a little bit here to the Cowboy and Copas tribute album that Don Reno and Red Smiley did. Of course, uh, in a way, this is uh, economically convenient because Cowboy Copas had recorded for King, and I guess King had the publishing rights on all these songs. They and did. There. They did. Uh, how many, uh, I'm always curious about things like this, who selected the songs? Did you go through the Copas repertoire and pick the ones you wanted, or did Sid have a few in mind? Or uh, Me and Red... Uh more or less selected the numbers and okay. uh, went to Sid with him and he approved of all of them. Uh -huh. But there wasn't anything that he was he violently wanted in there that you, uh, you know, absolutely wouldn't do or vice no, versa. No, no. Uh, this, this suited him perfectly. Red, it's certainly nice that King Records give us the opportunity to record in bluegrass style some of the songs that were best loved by our good friend Cowboy Copas, isn't it? It certainly is, Don, and this is the songs that Cowboy Copas loved to sing around home and to his friends. Right you are. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's uh, get busy and start recording some of the songs and we'll say some more about our good friend Cowboy Copas later on in the album. All right? Bluegrass fans not, might not initially associate that song with Cowboy Copas. Lots of the bluegrass bands have done it. Nobody ever had a big bluegrass hit on it. Uh, you probably, at least yours got out on a single there. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jimmy Martin had it in an album, Lester Earl used to do it on shows and so forth. Right. And song from Big Slim, who used to work up on wheeling. And uh, again, just parenthetically here, that kind of singing, when I heard Big Slim do it, I thought I couldn't understand it. And then I heard several other people in the, uh, with 30s, uh, within the 30s time frame, that sang like him. Was that a more popular, more of a vibrato in country music, it wasn't like pop country or anything, but when Big Slim sang, it was sort of like cowboy vibrato. Well, I think Big Slim was actually from Arizona or uh -huh. one of the western okay. states, and this was his style of thing. And he was on WWVA when I was up there. With Toby Stroud. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he was a very colorful figure. Uh-huh. Um, in other words, uh, 
He looked like a million dollars when he walked out. <laughs> okay. Uh, he looked better than his son, to tell you the truth about it. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, he's also the writer of Sunday's Eye of the Mountain. At least I that's know. what he, he says. A good, on. good yeah. writer. Yeah, and Wheeling used to be a uh, just a super great live Saturday night show where they had about everybody in the world that the Opry didn't have tied up. It was the second biggest show, I'd yeah. say, from the Opry because it had everything sewed up from... On the East Coast, that the opera couldn't reach, right. on into Canada. Yeah, that signal beaming northeast like that. Yeah. And uh, nowadays, they got people who's they read their personal appearances, and their big appearance is Thursday night in the tap room in upstate New York. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so they they lost track of some stuff somewhere. Very interesting album came out in the early 1970s, I guess, the last time together album with Don Reno and Red Smiley. Obviously, from the different little sound qualities in it, an assortment of songs from different sessions. Right. And uh, and yet, uh, had they? did you ever have any wind that they were going to put it out as an album back uh, in the 60s, or was this a surprise to you when it came out? No, I'm the one that hunted up the uh, oh. uh, Masters in the Vault in 73, uh, I believe it was. Okay, yeah. 72 right. or 73. Yeah. Uh, I told Hal Neely that me and Red had another album in the can. Uh -huh. It hadn't been released, and uh, he said, "We'll go in the <clears throat> vault and find it, and stay there till you do find it, uh -huh. and I'll send food in to you <laughs> if I have to." Yeah, and uh -huh. I found the master numbers in uh, yeah approximately three hours after that. Good gracious! You got to go in and tell somebody what they got. Yeah. Uh, all right. And when is the Don Reno guitar album ever going to come out? I don't know. I venture to say one day it'll come out. Mm -hmm. When when we all least expect it. Probably after I'm dead and gone. <laughs> <laughs> From this uh, album, let's talk a little bit about, uh, uh, of course, Willie Nelson wrote the song Family Bible and sold it outright, so his name is not on it. That's the story I have. But I hear a touch of electric. Is this Steve Chapman in this? Uh, right. He's playing the guitar. And he's since gone on to quite a Nashville sideman career, has he not? He sure has. Uh huh. Uh, re regular upright electric guitar is, uh, it's, it's not a, it's not a slide effect or anything. It sounds no, like it uh, He started working with me and Red when he was 14. Okay. On top of the morning. Mm hmm. One day a week. Oh, then okay. Then I got him up to two days and finally up to the week. And finally they started taking him on the road with me. Huh. And I trained him to play. Uh, in the background and not get too advanced out far. You know, and, right. and he was terrific uh, at staying in his place with the electric right. guitar. Did you encounter any antagonism from hardcore bluegrass people? No, not then. Okay. Not You're then. right, the lines were not. It wasn't the kind of civil war between acoustic and electric that it got to be later on. No, people it? didn't pay any attention to it back then. Just as long as it was good music and it was country. Right. Okay, well, then we will hear Steve. Uh, Steve Chapman in here on the Family Bible. Family Bible, another song, Don, that you picked out as one of Red Smiley's favorites. We are in our live interview part two with the legendary Don Reno, also paying tribute to the memory of Red Smiley here very close to the 12th anniversary of his death. Family Bible there. When, uh, for a brief period there, after Bill Harrell was your main partner there, Red was back with you, and you were all three together there in, in what was a super great band, and uh, that kind of gave you almost an embarrassment of riches, didn't you? You had it's like an all-star band. Who's going to do what here? Because everybody can do so much so well. Well, that's the truth because we had Buck Ryan with us too, and you yeah. know, he was almost uh, a <clears throat> star in his own right. Oh, sure. That's another another fiddler that that should have gotten a lot more publicity than he did. He sure was. I don't believe anybody could ever back a slow song any prettier than the late Buck Ryan could. No, and he was just a super trooper, you know. Yeah. It was all of his life. Uh, and it's another, another man. That, I mean, he was, uh, sometimes it would almost scare me how much of a gentleman he would be to me. I thought, hey, no, I don't deserve all this respect here. <laughs> you know, he'd be that way with me. The Together Again album cut for the Rome Company out in Columbus, Ohio. Was that really uh, something that you did yourself? Rome was not uh, 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 operating a continuing kind of label, is it? Or, or no, is it? it started off to be, I thought it might be. Uh, we was going to try to kind of help uh, start the label, yeah. you know, and uh, there was some things that uh, me and Red wanted to record, and uh, they gave us free reign on uh -huh. recording what we wanted to. Yeah, 
And so the, what emerged here, I remember another fine cut, we won't have time to play it here, but uh, it was Soldier's Last Letter, which is another great country song. I always thought it worked real well in yeah. bluegrass. And this one we picked out because Red Smiley sings bass on this. There are several lead singers floating around. Now, you have, let, let's mention here, I remember you talking about uh, when you were with Arthur Smith, singing just about all the parts in the Crossroads Quartet. Right? Yeah. Just everything from high tenor all the way down to bass. <laughs> <laughs> so, and on this one, we will hear Red Smiley sing bass. And let's see, Jerry McCurry, we agreed, sang baritone, right? Right. Okay, and Bill Harrell lead and you the tenor on the old Bill Monroe song, Shine, Hallelujah, Shine. One of the great recordings done at the great Don Reno and Red Smiley sessions in May of 1971 for Ray Davis's Wango label up in Baltimore. Just a message, one of the old Pete Castle songs, one of my all-time favorite singers. Mine, too. Yeah, and you, we were talking about being Red's uh, favorite, one of his favorite singers, too. That man could just uh, wring every ounce of intensity out of any song that he ever sang, and we can hear it in yours and Red singing there on Just a Message. Right. Pete could take any song and make a great song out of yeah. it. Yeah, the build is the blind minstrel and made only a couple of dozen records in his career, but they will last forever. Just before we conclude this hour with our live in-studio visit with the legendary Don Reno. Don, is there anything, just in general, uh, reflective kind of thing that you'd like to add about Red Smiley through all your years of partnership and friendship with him? Uh, yes, Bill. Uh, this last song you're fixing to play marked uh, an era of recording for one of the greatest guys, one of my greatest friends, and one of the greatest musicians that there'll ever be again. And this was his last recording. 